The study of history may be fascinating. It may even be ennobling. But does it do any good? Can history tell us how we need to conduct ourselves today? Five more questions for historian Stephen Kotkin. Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Stephen Kotkin grew up in New York City, received his undergraduate degree from the University of Rochester and his doctorate from the University of California at Berkeley, and then taught history for more than three decades at Princeton. Professor Kotkin is the author of nine works of history, including the first two volumes of his biography of Joseph Stalin, Paradoxes of Power, 1878 to 1928, and Waiting for Hitler, 1929 to 1941. Professor Kotkin is now completing his third and final volume, Stalin, Totalitarian Superpower. Last year, Stephen Kotkin left Princeton to become a full-time fellow here at the Hoover Institution, which among its many other benefits for your friends and admirers is that it should make scheduling these interviews much easier. Stephen, welcome. Five questions. Thank you. It's great to be back, and it's great to be here full time. Yeah, good. The war in Ukraine. Uh, a lesson of history, as this layman understands it, and then a few quotations. I'm going to take a moment or two to set this up and then just step back. Mm. So here's the lesson of history. We saw it in the First World War, and we saw it in the Second World War. Unless the United States intervenes on behalf of democracy and peace in Europe, Europe is a mess and will drag us in sooner or later anyway. That's the lesson of history. Okay. Here's a quotation. Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky on the new $45 billion aid package enacted at the end of last year. This is the second spending bill for Ukraine in two months. Our total aid to Ukraine will almost equal the entire military budget of Russia, and it's not as if we have money lying around, close quote. Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio, I'm sick of Joe Biden focusing on the border of a country, Ukraine, I don't care about, while he lets the border of his own country become a total war zone. Final quotation, foreign policy expert Elbridge Colby, mm. arguing that we should leave the defense of Ukraine substantially to the Europeans. Europe is both less important than Asia, less important to us economically and geopolitically, and our allies in Europe are far more capable of shouldering a big part of the burden of defending themselves against Russia than our Asian allies are of defending themselves against the far stronger China. Everything should be going to Asia while we deprioritize everything else." Close quote. Question one. Mm. Stephen, the lesson of history notwithstanding, what are we doing in Ukraine? Peter, I noticed you didn't quote Senator Tom Cotton on this question, but we'll take it from here. We heard a lot about the pivot to Asia, uh, a phrase that was a little bit unfortunate that came out of the Obama administration because it implied that we weren't there when, of course, the United States' involvement of Asia goes back a very long way, and it's been part of our prosperity and uh, our way of life for some time to have deep connections to Asia. So the pivot to Asia idea was that, yes, Europe was less important. Yes, Europe was rich and should take care of itself. Yes, Asia was the future. And yes, we needed to invest more there. And then the Ukraine war comes, that is to say, Russia has a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. They've already bitten off big pieces of Ukraine in 2014, for which I think we slapped both Putin's wrists, not just one wrist. And after those slaps on the wrist, he went and decided he wanted to take the whole thing. What did we discover? We discovered that his invasion of Ukraine and Xi Jinping's support mostly rhetorical, but nonetheless support of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, turned the Europeans into questioning whether they were too close to China or not. 
The beauty of Xi Jinping's strategy, which he inherited, was that there was a wedge between Europe and the United States on China policy. Meaning, sure, the U.S. was going to be hostile. The U.S., according to China, couldn't abide China's rise. The U.S. was going to hold China down any way it could. But the Europeans, well, they hate conflict. They love trade. They love business. And so for them, they were going to differentiate themselves from the U.S. by not having a hostile China policy. And that worked for a while for the Chinese, and then Xi Jinping just blew it up. He decided to throw his weight behind an invasion of a sovereign country on European soil. And the Europeans said, wait a minute. Maybe our China policy shouldn't be so distant from the U.S. Maybe the U.S. was right about China. Maybe we have to be wary of our dependence on China. Maybe we have to reconsider some of the trade pacts where China doesn't abide by international norms or international rules. Maybe, in other words, this is a wake-up call. Now, I could even add here that something similar happened in the case of Japan. Japan which is probably the country on the planet that, uh, maybe the only country, that understands deeply both the United States mm -hmm. and China, mm -hmm. having a long entangled history with China going back. Centuries. Yes. And now being an ally of the United States after that devastating defeat in the war. Japan, too, began to rethink its China policy and how close it needed to be to China versus how close it needed to be to the U.S. on Asian strategic questions. And so to a great extent in Europe and to a lesser extent in East Asia, it turned out that the pivot to Asia went through the transatlantic alliance. The stronger the transatlantic alliance got, the stronger China policy got. The more our allies came on side, the more that we weren't moving unilaterally against China. So the horror of the Ukraine war, and it is a horror, they are fighting and dying right now as you and I sit here comfortably speaking. The horror of the Ukraine war delivered a bounty to us on China policy. And so what some people are calling expenditure is actually an investment in our prosperity and security, because you're a lot stronger with friends and allies than you are when your friends and allies are moving in another direction. There's a wedge between you and your friends and allies. And so I think we got lucky here. This was not a policy. We did not sit around in the Situation Room or some other august setting on the White House property or in Foggy Bottom and say, how are we going to manage this China stuff? We'll have to reinvigorate the alliances. We'll have to reinvigorate our relationships with our friends. That's how we're going to do it. It was a gift from the Ukrainians. No one saw it coming. Their valor, their ingenuity, their willingness to defend their piece of the earth was a gift to us in our China policy. And it continues to do that. So, Stephen, before I said five questions, as if I could limit myself to five questions when I've got you at the table, but can you, I'm going to grant everything you just said because that was a remarkable answer. And as usual, on one of your answers, I can't even find a handhold. But let me ask a, a related but a somewhat different question. The Europeans, Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany, after the Ukrainian invasion, he gives a big speech. Things are different now. We're going to spend $100 billion this year on the military, and we're going to ratchet up our spending and get to the 2% of GDP that we've long promised we would spend, long promised NATO we would spend. Yeah. And of course, it doesn't happen. And indeed, this latest, what was in the news over the last couple of weeks is that ger the, germ the Poles have German-made tanks and want permission to let the Ukrainians use those German-made tanks that the Poles own. And the Germans wouldn't even grant that permission unless we went in. The number of German tanks in question is, I believe, single digits. 
And we're going in and have now committed ourselves to a, I don't remember the unit, squad, squadron? Of, battalion. Battalion of Abrams tanks, which numbers 30 as I read. It's in double digits. Okay. The, even though the, the Europeans said, this is our moment, we will rise to this challenge, what the Ukraine has demonstrated is their dependence on the United States. Why is it that they can't pull themselves together? The EU has been in existence for six decades. They couldn't handle a problem in Kosovo on their own continent. Now they can't handle an even bigger and direr problem, more direct threat to them. It's already impinging on their economic well-being. Why is it that they can't? They're as populous as we are, they're as rich as we are, and they cannot pull themselves together. Why? Um, how, how to answer that excellent question. So first we have to acknowledge that Europe is an enormous success. That's why it's good to be friends with them. The European Union? Europe as a whole is an enormous right. success. There are a bunch of very rich countries for the most part, they have rule of law and stable constitutional systems. They democratized over time, just like the United States did. More and more people got the right to vote there. And their peace and prosperity is deep. It's in values terms. It's not something that is easily sloughed off by this election or that election or this economic crisis or, or whatever have you. And so they are a success. Now, we can talk about the European Union. We live here in a country where the left loves the European Union, and yet they won't let us teach Western civilization on a college campus. Western civilization is evil to them, and yet they love the European Union. And then the right, they detest the European Union. And yet, they want Western civilization to be taught on the college campus. So it's a very strange situation that we find ourselves in. Western civilization, one side won't let us have it, and the other side can't abide it. And yet, they're connected. There are many, many issues with the European Union that the Europeans would like to fix, and they can't because of all the issues that you know. Our friends in Britain got out of the European Union in a process that uh, we have to wait and see the, in the fullness of time what that's going to look like. But it doesn't look very successful now because it was a club for all its faults of highly rich, successful, rule of law, democratic, prosperous countries. And so you'd want to be in that club. There are other clubs you could join. And they're not so good. They have some of the same bureaucratic nightmares without the prosperity and the rule of law. So let's acknowledge that Europe is a success. Let's also acknowledge that bringing in our friends in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. the former Soviet satellites, has done wonders for Europe. It's changed the tone to a very great extent, both in security terms, and just in wider terms of who has a voice, who should have a voice, what's the center of gravity in Europe, and how should Europe operate? That story is also still unfolding. Sure, some of the countries are small, but Poland is not a Poland small country. Small. Mm -hmm. It's changed the religious makeup of Europe a little bit because some of the countries that came in are more religious than some of the countries that were there. So Europe is an unfolding project with much disappointment, but overall it's packed, it's a club of very successful countries and its dynamic is shifting a little bit because of its enlargement and, and the same goes for the NATO story. So I'm actually not a, a, a fanatical critic of Europe, although I understand how the European Union operates in practice. I'm familiar with the history and the current situation, but I want to have Western Civ on our college campuses, and I want to have the European Club as our partner.
You know, let's talk about the 2% for a second because yeah. you raised the big issue and you framed it properly with the U.S. in World War One and World War Two, Kosovo. So if, if uh, I commit 2% of my income to something, you're going to get something from that. If Peter Thiel decides to commit 2% or even 3% of his income... Then you become a rounding error. Yeah. And so as the, even the Germans who have a substantial economy, very large economy, even the Germans to get to 2% is never going to be anything like 2 or 3% of the U.S. economy in any way. And then you factor in many other issues that we could discuss. But the point being is that polling gets, is over 2%. The UK over 2%. Some of the other countries are under 2%. If each one of them got to the number or above it, the US would still be the dominant military there. Right. And so either we disarm the US, which is certainly an option. Um, we've demobilized after wars previously. We could roll it back, cut it back, spend the money elsewhere. Come what may, let the Europeans take care of themselves, let the Japanese take care of themselves, let the Middle East take care of itself. Well, that's that sounds pretty attractive, really. That's certainly an option. All right. We could do that. And, and there are some savings in the short term on that. But historically, there aren't a lot of savings. If you look at the history and you look at the way the world works, uh, the U.S.'s provision of security guarantees globally is why the world is a better place today than it was a hundred and something years ago when the U.S. was not so committed. So it is a cost that we pay or it's an investment. And Stephen, you don't feel that it would be better, that the alliance would be better if Germany had an army. Well, if it were more, it if, if the one. French and the Germans we're more self-respecting, frankly. It, at some basic level, it has to be debilitating that Macron and the president before him, who was such a non-entity, I can't even remember his name, and Sarkozy before him, yeah. they've all said we need a European. It's debilitating for them to say we need to stand up for ourselves and then fail to do it. Wouldn't they be better allies? Wouldn't the whole tone of the relationship be better if those, if those countries had not, over the last six decades, been infantilized by our taking care of them. Yeah, so I was with you until that last... I know, I thought I... That I last hammer blow. I overreached. That Darn last it, strong right. note on the piano. Of course it would be better. No question it would be better. First of all, let's understand that we develop a lot of weapons together with the Europeans, that our supply chains are, are interwoven, that we share technology. Let's also remember that the Europeans are good at many other things that benefit us. Let's call it big pharma. They're pretty good at big pharma. The, the uh, vaccines, which work, that we're, uh, I hope, justifiably proud of. I certainly have had my booster shot vaccine, I don't want to die from COVID. Uh, that was developed. Oxford, right, right, had a vaccine. BioNTech is a joint venture with the Germans. So the Europeans are pulling their weight in many ways. But yes, we do have a far superior military. And yes, they could and should do more. And yes, it's kicking and screaming and promising and not delivering. And yes, that's the world we live in. So what's the answer? Right. Uh, the answer is continue to engage with them and have them as our friends. Check. Or walk. No. The answer can't be to walk. No. Uh, we don't want a world uh, that looks like the world prior to American engagement in the world. Does that mean everything America did was smart? Everything America does is smart? That America has to bear all of the burdens or most of the... No, of course it doesn't mean that. 
That's why you have alliances. So sometimes you get in a relationship and you say, you know, I think that you're not washing the dishes enough. I think that you're not taking out the rubbish enough. I think that you're not spending enough time with me and let's go on a date. And there's all sorts of ways that you can negotiate, let's say, the division of labor, as Adam Smith once called it. So no, I'm not happy with the situation, but I'm not going to throw out the baby with the bathwater because we're in this terrific marriage that requires negotiation and that baby is going to grow up. And, and, and we're both invested. So, so yes, your critique definitely is a hit. You know, when you play that game Battleship and you get the hit and, and, and you put in the red peg, right. you got a red peg or two there, okay. yes. But, but I got to tell you, I don't want to lose all of these alliances and relationships. I don't want to lose the integrated global economy. I don't want to lose all the stuff that we built and that we died for on the battlefield, right? right? That stuff is just too valuable to us. Sure, there's some freeloading. Sure, we get that. Uh, President Trump reiterated the points of his predecessors a, a little bit more Trumpian fashion about the 2% problem. He was right. They know he was right. They are pacifist nations. This is one of the reasons why the Russian argument about NATO being a threat was so silly because it's it's an alliance where almost everyone is a pacifist nation right. in the alliance and doesn't have a real army like the Germans, but they'll get there. Uh, they'll get there because the world is forcing things that way, unfortunately. Right. And the point of having an army, Peter, is, as you know from the Reagan administration, the other guy decides not to do stuff Correct. against you. Correct. All right, back to Ukraine and what comes next. Again, let me give you three, three quotations. Neil Ferguson, our friend and colleague at the Hoover mm. Institution. This is Neil last autumn. Ukraine could celebrate the first anniversary of this war. That is, the first anniversary will take place this very month as you and I speak. Ukraine could celebrate that anniversary by driving Russia all the way to the status quo ante of February 23rd, 2022. That's Neil Ferguson. Henry Kissinger in The Spectator just last month. The time is approaching to achieve peace through negotiation. Vladimir Putin, in an essay in 2021, there is no historical basis for the idea of Ukrainian people as a nation separate from the Russians. Neil says the Ukrainians are willing to fight and capable of fighting. Henry Kissinger says, no, 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 negotiations. And Vladimir Putin says, Ukraine is my country. I will do what I need to do to defend my country, and it is my country. Stephen, question two, how will this end? Well, um, we don't know how it's going to end, but we know where we are. The Ukrainians, amazingly, fought off Russia's attempted conquest. Russia failed in its maximalist aims of taking the capital, Kiev, and installing some type of puppet regime. And so uh, being denied in their maximalist aims looks like Russia's lost the war from that point of view. Mm -hmm. But as we said from the beginning, the problem with that argument is not that the Ukrainians uh, aren't courageous and ingenious. It's that Russia is destroying their house. So let's imagine that you have a house. I use this metaphor, maybe I overuse it. And your house has 10 rooms. It's the only house you have. And somebody barges in and snatches two of those rooms. It's your house and they just snatch two of those rooms. And they wreck them. They completely wreck them. And what's worse, from those two rooms, they're trying to wreck the other eight rooms of your house. You don't have another house. This is it. And moreover, the person who took those two rooms, that person has their own house, which has a thousand rooms. 
So they don't need your house. They say they need it. They say it's theirs. It's not theirs. But they don't actually need your house. But you, you don't have another house. And so here you are where they've gotten two of your rooms and they're trying to wreck the other eight and they won't go away. And so this is why I've said from the beginning that despite the prevention of conquest, right, despite the fact that the we Ukrainians the two held the capital, Kiev, right. nonetheless, you cannot call this a victory. In fact, as I've said before, this is one of those problems with Vladimir Putin. I can't have Ukraine. Nobody can have Ukraine. I'll just wreck it. This also tells you why the Chinese can't take Taiwan. If they take it, they can't have it. They don't get a country that's prosperous, don't dynamic, give me the whole middle argument. class. We're coming to Taiwan. That's, that's okay. All right. But the point being is that Ukraine shows that if you take it militarily, you don't actually get it. You get a smoking pile of room. So that's where we are. Wars begin as wars of maneuver, because somebody starts a war. Right. They begin as wars of maneuver. There's just a lot of ground taken at the beginning. It looks like that's how the war is going to continue. And then a couple of things happen. If there's a victory, the other side can capitulate and acknowledge that victory. The other side can say, we don't capitulate. We're going to fight a guerrilla war, an insurgency, right. like what happened to us in Iraq. We had this incredible military victory on the battlefield, and then we couldn't consolidate those gains. We ended up in an insurgency, counterinsurgency, and our colleague, General McMaster, H.R. McMaster, he invented modern counterinsurgency against the Iraqi insurgency when it shouldn't have happened in the first place because we needed to consolidate that victory. Okay. The other way that wars go, and this is probably more typical, is what we call a war of attrition where each side is grinding down the other side, losing massive casualties, inflicting massive casualties, gaining an inch, losing an inch. This a war of attrition is not a stalemate because they're killing you. They're killing you every day. They're killing them right now as we speak. And moreover, they could advance in a war of attrition. You can win or lose a war of attrition. How do you win a war of attrition, which is what we're in in Ukraine? There's two ways to win a war of attrition. One, willpower. Your willpower holds and the other guy's willpower collapses. That hasn't happened yet on either side. Both sides have the will to continue fighting. Both sides assume that if they continue, they can destroy the other side's willpower at a certain point. So that war of attrition where you think the other guy's willpower is collapsible can continue indefinitely. The other way is if you can't collapse the willpower, you have to outproduce the fighting capability, the weaponry, the stuff, and you have to destroy the other guy's fighting capability. That was us and the Soviets in the Second World War. Yeah. Stalin produced tanks. We produced ships. Lots of them. And, and planes. And, oh, and, no, no. All, and of course, we fought the Japanese in the Pacific simultaneously. So you win a war of attrition by either breaking the other guy's will and or out producing, producing in a massive way over time. So what do we see here? We see that we're giving Ukraine stocks stuff that we have in stock, right? So, javelins, which destroy tanks, stinger missiles, which destroy things in the air. That was the beginning of the war. And now we're up to giving them the Abrams tanks that you referred to. Mm -hmm. We're not producing more of that stuff. We haven't ramped up the production on our side. We're just emptying the warehouse. The, yes, the Wall Street Journal, uh, January 31st did a brilliant article about the fact that Ukraine has expended 13 years of javelin production. 13 years of javelin production. So now we have to ramp up javelin production, but we don't have a 
the assembly lines. We don't have the military industrial complex because we wound it down. And so getting the stocks to be refilled, even if the Ukraine war were to stop today, which it's not, getting the stocks refilled requires several years of ramping up. Just restocking our own shelves. And then there's the uncertainty for the, the military contractors. If they ramp up now, will the demand still be there in three years or in five years? What if the war is over by then? They need some type of guaranteed contracts to invest in massive expansion of their production capacity. And so we are not expanding production capacity. So we're going to run out of stuff. How soon? It's hard to say. The entire time, we've assumed that we can just, there's stuff, we can just send it. Right? Here it is. There's more. There's this. There's first, no, no HIMARS. Then we send the HIMARS and those HIMARS rockets, which are just fabulous mm -hmm. because they are, have precision uh, guided capability. And then it, now it's up to the tanks and we're fighting over the fighter jets. The point being is that we're sending the stuff that's already there in Europe in the warehouses that NATO uh, owns or, or stocks from the individual members of, of NATO or stocks that we have back here in the U.S. We didn't ramp up production massively on our side, in part because we said, well, we have sanctions. That's our secret weapon. And we're going to degrade the Russian economy. And they're going to run out of stuff on their side. And so at some point, they're going to be unable to continue the war because they're not going to have stuff. And so we heard that in March 2022. And we heard that in April 2022. And there were stories about how Russian missiles and, and tanks were using chips computer chips from washing machines because they were running out of production of computer chips. And look at this, the, this is going to end at some point because they can't keep our production. So this morning there was a massive barrage of cruise missiles and other missiles of Ukraine from the Russian side. So the stuff that they ran out of six months ago, they're still using it to destroy uh, civilian infrastructure, the energy grid, kill people, murder them actually, hospitals, schools being destroyed. So evidently, the Russians still have a lot of stuff. They're able to produce stuff. And so we are not degrading their ability to fight with the sanctions. So we're in a war of attrition where we're not destroying as we did in World War II, their production capacity, the way we did to the Germans and the Japanese, because we're not hitting we're not Russian the territory. Border. We're not permitting the Ukrainians to go over the, Correct. the border. And we're not ramping up production on our side. So you tell me how you win a war of attrition where you're not attriting. You're not actually destroying their capability to fight, and you're not ramping up your capability. So I'm not confident that we have a good strategy for this phase of the war. You see, success is a problem. We were successful in enabling, facilitating the Ukrainians' defense of their country. That has produced a new situation. That's produced a new version of the war that wasn't there at the beginning. We were prepared for supporting the Ukrainians in an insurgency. Russia would conquer Ukraine. That was the pessimistic thinking. Mm -hmm. Remember, we evacuated the embassy, right. we, et, et cetera. We agreed with Putin. We thought it would be quick. Yes, and we made the same error he made, which was to overestimate his military and underestimate right. the Ukrainians' ability to defend their country. But now that's happened. And now we're in this new phase. The new phase has been characterized by incremental support for Ukraine. And, and many, this makes many people angry. If you're going to support them, what are you doing slowly, slowly ramping up, grudgingly saying no, uh, yes on this weapon after saying no for so long? Why don't you just give them everything? And the answer is, is because our policy, which is rooted in domestic politics and alliance politics, 
has been not to get in a direct U.S. or NATO combat war with the Russians. There's no domestic support for that in the U.S., and there's certainly no domestic support in Europe, and it would potentially fracture the alliance, and it would potentially uh, change the ability of Congress or the desire of Congress to vote that money that you refer to. So this incrementalism, why? Why do we have the incrementalism? Because we don't want to get to an escalation into a direct war with Russia, a proxy war rather than direct wars are policy. Uh, but the other reason is, is because Russia possesses certain capabilities and those capabilities are for real and they haven't used them yet. And people say, oh, they'll never use a nuke. They'll never escalate to using nuclear weapons or whatever it might be. And the answer is that's probably true. There are a lot of reasons they're deterred. Like, for example, they would lose their own country because there would be a response potentially, right? So it looks very logical to say they'd never do it. But if you're the commander in chief and you sat across the table like this with one of our commanders in chief uh, to discuss putting his thoughts into writing, and you knew those thoughts well. If you're the commander in chief, you buy all those arguments about how they're deterred, but the problem is, is they have the capability. Right. And so you cannot just assume that it's all going to work out rationally or the way it's supposed to work out. You have to assume that if someone has the capability, you have to prepare for the fact that that person has the capability. And, and I... so I've been, I've been saying that his threats are empty from the beginning. I was unimpressed with Putin's threats. You know, if you do this, if you support Ukraine, uh, fire and brimstone. I came, with this, I came up with this equation very <clears throat> early in the war. Ukrainian valor plus Russian atrocities equals Western unity and resolve. And so the whole war is an atrocity. Everything Russia does, they're, they're bombing the schools, they're bombing the hospitals, they're murdering civilians. It's nothing but atrocity. And the Ukrainian courage and valor, despite the losses that they've taken, massive losses of killed and wounded, it's still there. And so Western unity and resolve is still there. But I so knew- if, you're, if, if I may, we have an ally in President Zelensky who says this war is not done until we c reclaim every inch of our country that the Russians have taken. And he is not just talking about stopping at the status quo ante before 20, February 2022. He wants back the Crimea, which the Russians took in 2014. So if I'm just, Go ahead. just playing this out for you, if you're our commander in chief, you're dealing with an ally who wants to take back the Crimea, and there's just a little historical fact about the Crimea that Sebastopol is their main naval uh, port on the Black Sea, and it was established by Catherine the Great yes. in 1783. The Crimea has been Russian since five years before we ratified the Constitution. Yes. Is there some possibility? I have, a, I have a, an ally, Zelensky, who wants it back, and there's a man sitting in Moscow who has tactical nuclear weapons. This is a problem. Is it not? Yeah. The definition of victory is the whole game. All right. You nailed it. So let's just finish the point that we're fighting a war of attrition. That's where we are. We're in right, a war of right, attrition right. with two hands behind our back. We're not ramping up production. That's one hand. And we're not destroying his production. That's the other hand. So either you're going to fight a war of attrition properly or your chances of winning it are going to be diminished. So that's, that's the first and most important point. Either we have to ramp up production on our side and or we have to destroy his production or we're not in a good situation. Let's talk about the war aims, how you define victory, just as you, mm -hmm. you put it down. President Zelensky's definition of victory is re re recuperation, reclaiming, 
of every inch of internationally recognized Ukrainian territory, including okay. Crimea. Including Crimea. All of it. Reparations for the damage that the Russians did in the criminal aggression, and a war crimes tribunal for those on the Russian side who are guilty of the war crimes and of launching the war in the first place. How do you think you're going to get reparations and a war crimes tribunal? Maybe you're going to take Moscow right. and impose yes, that? This is right. So that definition of victory makes complete sense from an emotional point of view. Someone is occupying two rooms of your house and lobbing missiles and drones in the rest of your house and killing your people. Totally unprovoked. Right. And so therefore, I get at all levels of psychology, emotion, history, their definition of victory. But I'm living in the world that we're living in. And so I'm not sure that that definition of victory is attainable. Moreover, suppose they get every inch of territory back. Suppose that happens, right? Right now we're living through uh, a, a, what could well be an offensive by the Russians. There are indications here on the one-year anniversary that the Russians are ramping up. They did their mobilization way back in the fall. It's been about four months since they mobilized those troops who've now been through training. They've ramped up some of their production of, of their war equipment. Partially they purchased it from Iran or in other surreptitious deals with neighbors. Uh, partially they went back and got the stuff that they had originally sold to Africa or to other countries. And so they've been restocking, plus they've been figuring out how to produce again, despite the sanctions. And so now we see what could be an offensive. And then the Ukrainians are going to have a count, uh, if they hold the line against the Russian offensive, which looks like it's probably happening now. Maybe the Ukrainians then launch their own counteroffensive, and by then they have the tanks that we've promised potentially, and they've had training on the tanks. And they have workshops to repair the tanks that are destroyed on the battlefield because tanks don't last more than a couple of days even right. if you're doing well in a war. They have to be rebuilt or fixed in some way. Okay, so let's imagine that the U Russian offensive fails. If it happens, it fails. And the Ukrainian counteroffensive is massively successful beyond everyone's wildest dreams and they take back the territory. Russia army disintegrates in the field and all sorts of great things happen for the Ukrainians. Then what? You see, you have a couple of big issues that aren't going away. One is this war is about Ukraine joining the West. If Ukraine gets back every inch of its territory and is not admitted into Europe, is that a victory? Moreover, if Ukraine doesn't get back every inch of its territory, but is admitted to Europe, is that a victory? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. So the game here is not necessarily territorial. We understand that from a humanitarian point of view. The game is accession into the EU. And so that process, which President Zelensky also talks about, and which has been promised, right? that process is the game and that needs to be accelerated and we need to be on a pathway to that that's realistic. The Western Balkans, North Macedonia, Serbia, they've been uh, undergoing EU accession almost since you and I had hair that was darker color. And they haven't gotten there yet because EU accession is you check the box, then it's another box. You check that box, internal reforms until you check all the, and only until every box is checked do you get in. Right. And so you could be checking boxes for 10, 12, 15 years as the Western Balkans have been, making progress, doing well, but there's no intermediate stage of admission. You're either in or you're out. I see. And so that's one piece. And then the other piece is geography. So let's imagine that Ukraine cannot pick up Russia, 
move it to the other side of China, and then drop it there. Let's imagine that this Russia thing stays where it is. And it's a country of 100 plus million people, and it's got a substantial sized economy, and there's a strategic culture there that may change, may not change. If Russia does not get transformed into France in our lifetime. Which will not happen. If, if, if it happens, great. And if it doesn't happen, what? Tell me what then, right? So France is this magnificent country. It's uh, rich. It's got a military, unlike the Germans. It's very proud of its civilization, its culture, its history. And it doesn't attack its neighbors and decide to take over their territory anymore. And so that would be a great outcome if Russia became like France. It has an absolutist tradition like the French, you know, a sort of old regime. Czar. It, it, it has a revolutionary tradition like the French. It has an imperial tradition like the French. The problem is it's not enough like the French, right. the Russian thing. And so if the Russian thing is not transformed uh, institutionally, but also deeper fundamentally in terms of strategic culture, then Ukraine has to live there. And so there needs to be some type of DMZ or demilitarized zone like we have on the Korean Peninsula. Think about the Korean Peninsula. Is that a good solution? There was an armistice. The war actually never ended. Uh, the, the, the fighting was paused with the armistice. And yes, there are occasional instances of cross-border violence, but for the most part, the armistice is held since 1953. And South Korea became part of the West. It's just this en enormously successful story. So, quote, our part of Korea, right, it's not a solution. North Korea still exists. The DMZ is there. There's no peace treaty. Now the North Koreans have nukes, just like the Russians already have with nukes. So it's not a perfect solution by any means. But it looks good given what the options were in reality for, for South Korea to be able to become a prosperous and eventually, after a lot of internal convulsions, a democratic rule of law country and a great ally of ours. And so that's the outcome we have to get to in Ukraine unless, unless, there's a trend. unless Russia becomes France, which only the Russians can do to themselves. There's no evidence that this is happening. So we need a solution that fits the reality, which is Ukraine can become a rebuilt, prosperous country like South Korea, join the Western club, which is not geographical, but institutional. It's about rule of law, constitutional order, open, dynamic market economies, free societies, right? That's the solution in whatever territory they're able to reclaim. I would be ecstatic if Ukraine was able to reclaim the territory under international law at a cost that was bearable. Right now, uh, we're waiting to see if that can happen. More casualties are in the immediate future. This could go on for quite some time. The production is not there. We may run out of stuff before the, ironically, before the Russians run out, we might run out of stuff. Can you imagine? After all the talk about how the Russians can't do this, they're going to run out, the sanctions are going to work. I'm not sure now. And so the path that we're on, God willing, it works. Ukraine gets its territory back on the battlefield. Russia is transformed into France somehow. And then we can have the kind of solution that President Zelensky has outlined as victory. If we don't get that, then what? My answer is an armistice, which has to be forced on the Russians now. And as, on Zelensky. And on the Ukrainians. And an armistice Ukraine. that enables Ukraine to be rebuilt. The rebuilding of Ukraine alone is just the phenomenally complex and expensive proposition. People are talking about 350 billion as the estimated cost of rebuilding Ukraine right now. 
I think that number is a lowball number, but let's take that number. The entire Ukrainian economy, its GDP pre-war, was $180 billion. So you're talking about a reconstruction, which is two times GDP. That's just a lot of money that has to not vanish, not disappear. We had the COVID uh, support that our Congress passed for uh, wages and for other things. And guess what? That was not twice our GDP. That was not even one-tenth of our GDP. And a lot of it vanished. And we have institutions, we have rule of law, we have independent judiciary, things that Ukraine doesn't have yet. They, they could get them with an EU accession process. They're fully capable. It's unbelievably impressive what they've been able to achieve so far. I would never bet against them. I would bet in favor of them. But how in the world, with their current level of institutions, are they going to bring into that country, double their GDP in reconstruction money, even if we get the armistice today. So we need to talk about what victory actually could look like rather than what we would like victory to look like. And we need to get there sooner rather than later. And so that means forcing this criminal to the negotiating table on terms that are more favorable. Remember, our friend, that chief executive that you sat across the table with, that commander-in-chief putting his words into writing, remember that he understood that you negotiate. That's the only way to solve any issues. That's the only way to advance American interests. You negotiate, but you negotiate from a position of strength. Yeah. Stephen, other side of the planet. A few headlines. Then a quotation. We're in Taiwan now. All the headlines come from the Wall Street Journal. October 3rd, 2021. Record Chinese aircraft sorties near Taiwan prompt U.S. warning. January 3rd, 2022. China scrambles fighter jets near Taiwan in wake of U.S. carrier exercises. December 26th, 2022. We're only talking about a couple of months ago. China sends waves of warplanes near Taiwan Maneuvers come a day after President Biden signs defense policy bill authorizing $10 billion in military assistance to Taiwan. Those are the headlines. Here's the quotation. This comes from a memorandum that U.S. Air Force General Michael Minahan sent to his officers last month that got leaked. No surprise. I don't know how you send a, a memo to a a large group of people and expect it not to get leaked, but here's the quotation. General Minahan, quote, I hope I'm wrong. My gut tells me we'll fight in 2025. United States presidential elections are in 2024 and we'll offer Chinese President Xi a distracted America. Taiwan's presidential elections are in 2024 and we'll offer Xi a reason to attack. Close quote. Stephen, question three, Taiwan. They're getting easier and easier, Peter, as always <laughs> with you. You're just, over, you're, you're, as usual, very well prepared here. So we began uh, with this issue of uh, if you take it, you can't have it. We also talked about running down our stocks. Right. We're four years behind, three to four years behind on deliveries to Taiwan of what we've promised them, and in some cases, what they've paid for, weapons deliveries. So you're General Milley, and you're sitting there. And the, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs right now. And you've got that you know, nice office in the E-wing of the Pentagon, mm -hmm. and you're sitting there at a table bigger than this one, and you look like this, and there go your javelins. There go your stingers. There go your munitions, right? Your, your howitzer and, and other munitions. And you're just sitting there and the stuff is just going out the door. And you can't call Raytheon and say, next month I want to have triple the production 
or Lockheed Martin or fill in the blank, one of our great companies that produces uh, for the Pentagon in a very complex, broken procurement system. Okay. Moreover, the phone rings and it's Taiwan and they say, well, where's our stuff? We don't get any stingers. We're contracted, we're, we're paid for them or we're going to pay for them and where, where are they? And, and they're going out the door as Millie sits there to Ukraine. And so the definition of victory in Ukraine is also tied to the Taiwan story. We began with the idea that the pivot to Asia was a bad phrase. You would never have written a phrase like that had you still been there. Uh, you would have been much smarter and, and, and your prose would have been uh, much more precise. We began with that as a plus because it reinvigorated the alliance system. It explained that having friends to face China is much better than trying to do things unilaterally, especially friends who have high technology and are rich and, and are trustworthy because they've been in a relationship with you that's based on values, fundamental values. Okay. So that was the good part. The bad part is the longer a war of attrition goes on, the less stuff goes to Taiwan for deterrence purposes or, God forbid, for resistance purposes. So this is yet another argument for a definition of victory in Ukraine. When I talk about an armistice, when I talk about it's a victory if the, even if they don't regain all their territory as long as they get into Europe, I'm talking about victory, not capitulation. Right. This is not a story that we have to cut and run here that Russia gets to win something. Russia doesn't win anything. They have degraded their military in front of the world's eyes. They have de lost their status as an energy superpower. They have lost whatever, whatever semblance of self-respect they had in moral terms, right? They did this in Syria, and we thought it was some type of tactical victory in Syria because they're part owner of a civil war and atrocities in Syria. And now they're doing it in Ukraine. And so it's not a win for them. It's a massive loss. It's a deep degradation of their human capital. They lost the new economy. It fled the country, right? It lives in Armenia. It lives in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. So it's a massive loss for Russia. It's a win for Ukraine if we can get the war of attrition to be transformed into an armistice where Ukraine can get an EU accession process that's realistic, a security guarantee that might not be NATO but will be a security guarantee, and, and start focusing uh, on those contracts, on those promises that we have to Taiwan. Right? It's tough to bring Putin to the table over this. He's got to feel threatened. His regime has to feel threatened. You see, it's not about shaving a few points on his GDP. By the way, his GDP went down maybe 3% last year. Not that much, Ukraine surprisingly. went down, they're estimating 30%. It could be more like 40%. And Russia is projected to grow its economy in 2023. So... In any case, he's not a private equity mogul. He's not worried about his GDP growth. He's got to feel pain. And so you feel pain because your regime is threatened, because there are internal and external alternatives to your regime, that politically you are destabilized, right? That's where you get him to the bargaining table. Sure. Uh, you can continue to arm Ukraine, as we should, as I've been in favor of from the beginning. But where are our political operations, our political ops to destabilize that regime, to make him feel pain, for him to understand that if he continues, he loses his regime, not we shave a point or two off his GDP. So, so let's get there, because he's got a lot of vulnerabilities politically. And they need to be exploited. And let's not be wussies about it. But, what, let's what about, not be afraid. What, to what extent? So? And, and then let's focus on your Taiwan thing, which, will, yeah. which, which is exactly the right question so, Xi going Jinping, forward. Is Xi Jinping 
I've heard this argued both ways. Go ahead. A little layman that I am, I don't know how to decide. On the one hand, the argument is Xi, Xi, Xi Jinping is less likely today to go into Taiwan because he's looked at what happened to Russia. And he's not, he's not Vladimir Putin. He's not going to be happy just being the strutting man who gets to wreck Ukraine. What he sees in, has happened to Russia, he's much more rational. He sees what you see, which is that Russia has shredded its trust, shredded any possibility of alliance, humiliated itself. Before. He doesn't want that. On the other hand, yeah. what he also sees is that Putin got away with it. He's still in power. Bizarrely enough, to the extent that there's polling in Russia, the Russian people seem to have rallied to him. This conflict in some bizarre way seems almost to have been good for Putin politically. And then General Minahan has a point. We're busy yeah. with presidential elections in 2024. We're busy with Ukraine. We're distracted in all kinds of ways. And Taiwan is have, going to have a presidential election in 2024 in which on current trends, it looks as though the Independence Party may do very well. Xi Jinping has a time window. He's a man in his 70s. His time is limited. The West is distracted. Taiwan is provocative. Maybe we move. Maybe we move. How do you weigh these possibilities? You know, there's a secret here. <laughs> I'm hoping. The secret is, I don't know what Xi Jinping thinks. All right. And all the people who say they know what he thinks. They have no idea. They don't know either. All right. Because this is a single person regime and people inside that regime don't know. One of the things that we've discovered from totalitarian regimes after they're gone is that the insiders didn't know either. Stalin kept everybody guessing. His they own were, guys were guessing. They were practicing Kremlinology. Let's remember that when the CIA went public saying that Russia was going to attack Ukraine, it knew things that the number three person in Russia's Ministry of Defense didn't know. Because Putin had kept the circle really tight. And he didn't tell his own people. Very, very few people had any clue that he was actually going to do this. And so inside these regimes, they're guessing, what's the guy up to? What's the policy going to be? What are our orders? How should we behave? Do you know? Do I know? Are you up? Am I up? Who's down? Who's up? And so we think that there are these well-oiled machines and they have a strategy and they communicate it down the chain of command. And if you don't fulfill your orders, you're toast, right? If you don't fulfill your orders, they're going to take you out. They're, they're going to demote you or worse. We think of these regimes as more or less well-functioning, as more or less disciplined, as more or less capable. And they're just not like that. As more or less understanding what the strategy is and what the policy is. So some general has a birthday party for his kid and he blows up a balloon for his kid and the balloon gets out of hand and it ends up over Montana. <laughs> And this is gigantic white balloon. And, and who did that? And, and he was just trying to, have, you know, make sure his kid had the best possible birthday party. Sure, there was a lot of surveillance equipment on it. There was a lot of sophisticated tech on it because he didn't have other balloons for the birthday. He just needed that was the balloon closest off the shelf that he could use for his little daughter or his niece for the birthday party. And it ends up over Montana. These regimes. Uh, uh, they don't always know what they're doing, and the leader doesn't always know, let alone the leader's minions. So what's on Xi Jinping's mind? Boy, would I like to know. I would kill to know. But here's the thing that we know. This is the bottom line on Taiwan that you have to use as your point of departure, and we knew this. Well, some of us knew this before Ukraine, and Ukraine reconfirmed this. If you take it, you can't have it. So it has to be an act of desperation. It has to be, I can't have it, nobody can have it. It has to be, Taiwan is proclaiming its de jure independence, not de facto independence, but it's saying, we are now no longer part of China. 
and the U and the U.S. is has to recognize that or hint that it's going to recognize that. In which case, Xi Jinping has no choice but to say, "I can't have it. Nobody can have it, and so I'm going to take it and wreck it." Right. So, so that means he doesn't get the chips factories. He doesn't get the fantastic companies. Those Taiwanese, all that goes up in smoke, and so for him to try to take it militarily, we'll get to the part about whether he can or can't take it militarily. But for him to try to take it militarily, is an act of desperation. Once again, would he do that? Could he do that? Could he try that? Well, Putin did the Ukrainian thing. What Xi Jinping think about the Ukrainian thing? You tell me. I would love to know. And so the, the Taiwan knot is about how the status quo is working for us. It's failing for him. His status quo doesn't work. You see, he thought, I'm going to integrate Taiwan economically, make them dependent on us, integrate very deeply, and then they'll move politically towards our system. They'll want to join us because of the great benefits of being economically integrated. Where have we heard that before? That was U.S.-China policy. Mm -hmm. The same engagement fantasy that we had here in the U.S. For three decades. That same fantasy, which some people think still could work. Uh, he tried the same fantasy with Taiwan, and it didn't work in his case. On the contrary, the Taiwanese are less and less inclined to consider themselves ethnic Chinese or to want to be part of a political system with the mainland. That was already before Hong Kong, what Xi Jinping did in Hong Kong, right? So the status quo is failing for him. That's his problem, right? He, he has no way right now to bring Taiwan politically closer voluntarily. Because if it doesn't come voluntarily, he can only... He can only destroy it. Yeah. He can't have it. Right. And so he needs to have it voluntarily. And so he's not getting... It. So the status quo is beautiful for us. Taiwan is a self-governing, prosperous country that is not part of communist China. It's a rebuke in China's face. And as long as it doesn't try to become independent in law as well as in fact, it doesn't try to upset the status quo or we don't try to upset the status quo, we're winning that situation. Yes, better deterrence. Yes, get the stuff on the island before, God forbid, a war breaks out. Yes, the Taiwanese need to have different weapon systems than they previously ordered. Yes, they need better military training. Yes, we need scenario planning with our allies. All the stuff we're doing, by the way, all stuff that's working not at the pace that anybody would like, but is happening. But the key to us is we don't try to overturn the status quo. We just say, well, geez, we're winning. Let's continue to win. Okay. Stephen, <clears throat> one of my questions got subsumed in another. So this is going to be four questions. And now I'm coming up to my fourth question. Okay. Now, I have to sum up a little bit my impression of what has happened so far. Here's what's happened so far. I failed to answer three of your I'm, questions I'm, and now we're on oh, the no, fourth. No. <laughs> I am asking questions of a man who is capable, as very few other people are, of bringing to bear on the question history, a deep knowledge of history, a deep understanding of strategy, and an insistence on reality. What are the possibilities that reality gives us? Nor the DMZ in North in Korea is unsatisfying. We haven't, sure. we haven't won anything, but it permits South Taiwan, South Korea to become a great nation. It is incredible a great nation success, now. unbelievable incredible success, democratic, prosperous. All right. What's happening in Taiwan? We've got this cockamamie situation where it works in practice, but not in theory, so to speak, where Taiwan is allowed to be independent, to build its own tremendously powerful economy, to integrate deeply with the West, as long as they, pretend, as they, as long as they don't pretend they're actually independent. And Kotkin says, we can live with this. Maybe it's unsatisfying, but life is unsatisfying. 
we can live with this. You're bringing to bear the, 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 in some fundamental way, an understanding of the human condition based upon a lifetime spent studying history. And you say, let's find some kind of solution in Ukraine. Okay. Now, that's what I think has happened so far. And I'm now going to ask you about George Kennan and Henry Kissinger. This is the last question. Okay. George Kennan and Henry Kissinger. Again, I'm going to take a moment to set this up, but mm. and then I'm going to let you just take it. February 1946, George Kennan, who's then a State Department official posted in Moscow, sends the State Department a 5,000-word telegram, the so-called long telegram, in which right there, mm. at the beginning of the Cold War, he lays out the inner dynamics of Soviet communism and lays out the fundamental a strategy of containment, mm -hmm. which remains American policy for the next four and a half decades. How is it possible that he's able to write? And by the way, it's it's marvelously literate. It's beautifully written. I wish I could write like uh, that. So he does this, and back in Washington, they recognize the importance. And this is possible because Kennan has read widely. He understands Russian history, and he's dealing with people. Atchison. Chip Bolin. These yes. were literate people who had steeped themselves in history all their lives. This brings us to Henry Kissinger. He publishes a book last year at the age of 99 called Leadership. And Kissinger argues that at any given time, only a few people, only a few people, really understand the complexities of maintaining the world order. Now I'm quoting Kissinger. The contemporary world Here's reality. The contemporary world is in the midst of a transformation in human consciousness so pervasive as to be nearly invisible. He's speaking here about television, Facebook, Twitter, all of it. Sure. New technologies mediate our experience of the world and our acquisition of information. Reading a complex book carefully has become a countercultural act. Kissinger continues What risks being lost? in an age dominated by the image. The quality goes by many names, erudition, learnedness, serious and independent thinking. Emotional display is now privileged over self-command, changing the kinds of people and arguments that are taken seriously in public life, lacking a moral and strategic vision, the present age is unmoored." Close quote. So here's question four. And I'm asking it of a man who's devoted his professional life to the study of history, but also to the instruction of undergraduates. You've watched as the information revolution has rippled through the new rising generations of Americans. Are we still capable of producing the George Kennans and the Henry Kissingers and the George Schultzes and the Stephen Kotkins? I'm sorry you put me in that sentence. I'm secretly thrilled, but I'm sorry you put me in a sentence I don't deserve to be in, but thank you. I appreciate that. So we have history professors walk around the campus and they complain that students don't know any history. And it's true, they don't know any history, but why? Who's to blame there? Are the students to blame? Or are these professors that don't have anybody in their classes to blame? It's one where you got to pick the mirror up. We all have to look into the mirror and stop blaming the students that they don't know any history and figure out how to teach them history that they'd be interested in learning and that would be helpful and useful to them, consequential history. So we got to turn the mirror to ourselves here on this problem. That's the first and deepest point. Secondly... By ourselves, you mean contemporary academia? Those of us who are complaining that people don't know history... That's on us. Okay. That's not on them. I, I include myself in that group. That's I on mean, us. All right. We need to do better. We need to enthuse them about history so that they understand why it's valuable for them to know it. And we need to deliver it in a way that makes them lifelong devotees of history. Do we do that now? I'm not so sure we do. And so let's get our own house in order. Let's figure out how to teach history and enthuse young people about it and give them a history that's consequential and make them 
more than just learning history while they were at college or in AP uh, world history or U.S. history in high school. Let's give them a love of history and appreciation of why they should continue to read it. Okay, so that, that's the first point. The second point is there's a lot of junk history in the policy world. Everything is Munich. Right. Everything is Munich. It turns out not everything is Munich. It turns out Munich wasn't even Munich when you get down into the nitty-gritty details. Everything is Pearl Harbor, right? Eh, whatever it might be, whatever the simplistic analogy might be, we latch onto it and it becomes the defining uh, category or the defining meme in how we approach things. And so junk history is just as dangerous as no history because you think you know some history, but the history that you know is bunk or it's not applicable to the situation that you're in. History is a sensibility. History is a sensibility which says, you know, the present is not going to last. The present is going to change. I don't know how it's going to change. I don't know in what direction it's going to go. I only know it's going to change because that's happened every single time before. And so how did it happen before? Why did it happen before? Who did it? Whose agency, etc.? So we study the past to understand not just uh, what happened in the past, but to understand and to have the humility, right? The deep and fundamental humility that we're living with uncertainty, we're not sure, present is not gonna last, where is it gonna go? All of that is mm. comes from the sensibility of studying history. We study biography because we want to see exemplary lives. Sometimes it's exemplary in the negative sense. Your man we, Stalin. We don't want another Stalin. Sometimes it's exemplary in the positive sense. Let's say Lou Cannon's biography of Ronald Reagan. Sometimes it's exemplary in between. Let's say Robert Caro's Master of the Senate, right. which right. is just one of my favorite ever biographies. Uh, because of the complexity. Lyndon Johnson was effective, but he was also a pretty nasty piece of work. He could be, yeah. and, and Caro is honest in, in portraying that. But Johnson understood power and he knew how to use power. We can argue about the aims he pursued, but the beauty of the book is to show that he understood how power was accumulated, he knew how, 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 how you could increase your agency, how you could expand your scope of action how you could acquire leverage on the system in order to affect change. Whether the change is the direction that we would prefer or not is a political debate. But the analytical story is about the how you can do something like that and make it consequential. So that's the kind of history that you learn how to then understand or at least approach, pose the questions of contemporary policy issues. Not the junk history, which is at least as pervasive as the ignorance mm -hmm. of history. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that everybody needs to know history and here it is, it's on two sheets and one side of the sheet is, is Munich and the other side of the sheet is Pearl Harbor. Would right? it were that simple. Right. And, and so that's the first, the first and most important point is, is history is about humility. It's about a sensibility. And it's about figuring out leverage, scope for agency, f how systems work, and how you can shift a system. Reagan shifted a really big system. And how did he figure out how he could expand his scope for agency? How could he set in motion things that he set in motion when the system is so big and he's just a single and that's history, right? And there's also history of the fact that there's all these people that work 16 and 18 hour days and, and their labor is how we have a mug here that we can drink something to refresh ourselves. And I could go on, right? There's a massive story of who holds up the global economy through their sweat and their tears and their ingenuity and entrepreneurialism and, and their credit systems and, and their stable currencies and all the other things that are important, right? That's big history too. So, you know, Kennan 
let's be honest. Uh, he was, you know, for the Cold War until he was until against he was against, it. Yeah, he, he, he got six years of his life, he was right about everything, and it was he's 80 a, years wrong. In so some that. ways, he's a John Kerry figure, right? He was uh, for it until he was against it, as <laughs> yes. they said. Some of your um, audience will understand that reference. And, and, and Henry Kissinger uh, also, uh, there are things in Henry's career, Dr. Kissinger, excuse me, which are just, you marvel at, and then there are some other things which you wonder, did he really do he that, think that one, right? right? You know, so making, reducing the scope of Soviet influence in the Middle East, squeezing the Soviets out of the Middle East, that was pretty breathtaking. A, that he knew to do that, and B, that they pulled that off. Unbelievable lesson there for us today. On the other hand, the deal with China, with Mao, and, and the abandonment of Taiwan, and, and all of that kind of stuff, how does that look in the fullness of time, the Nixon-Kissinger triangulation of the Sino-Soviet split, so that the, we could peel the Chinese off from the Soviets onto our side, and in the fullness of time, we could maybe reevaluate that differently. I don't know, but that's a debate worth having. So, so can we have such people again? Because you pointed to the fact that we don't read in, as much yes. because we have entertainment, social media, the infotainment complex, etc. So let's remember that there was radio. And radio was a shot because they could just broadcast anything right into people's living room. Here are these people sitting at home in their living room. They touch the dial, and anybody can just broadcast demagogy or whatever. Right, right, right. And who was controlling it? Nobody was really controlling it. And, and the, the class of Brahmins, the, the great intellectual class, all the editors, the owners of newspapers, they were being bypassed by radio. It was the end of democracy, you see, because... They could say anything and people could get riled up and there would be untruth and there would be all sorts of rumors and, and, and the totalitarians were great at radio, Hitler and Goebbels were great at radio and Mussolini was great at radio and even Stalin who was, uh, had, had trouble with his voice uh, mastered radio and, and so radio looked like the end of democracy, looked like the end of the world for us. And then it turns out that democracy is adaptable, it's resilient, and the people aren't so stupid. And in fact, they, they can be entertained, but they can also understand what they're doing. And so we assimilated radio somehow. Roosevelt was the radio right, president. Became pretty good at it. He yeah. was the guy who mastered the medium and, and look at the success that he had in political terms of being elected four times. We can debate his policies. So, and, and then we had television. Mm -hmm. And my God, was that the end of the world? Who was going to read a book again after television came? And, and it was very upsetting and, and the images and manipulation. And, and we had Kennedy. Kennedy was our television president. Here's a young guy, hadn't achieved very much, you know, kind of voted present in the Senate. And here he is, he's, he's our president now, Kennedy. Once again, you can argue uh, for or against his policies or his... his, his uh, but he was spectacular on television. And, and there was this other guy who, who was no good. He was sweating all the time, wiping the sweat off his brow, and he had these jowls, and his name was Nixon. And, and, and so he wasn't a good TV president, was he? And then we, social media came. It's the end of the world again. It turns out nobody's going to read ever again. It turns out the totalitarians know how to manipulate images and words and the whole story. We're way behind the eight ball. Donald Trump gets elected. How in the world did that happen? It must be this crazy social media. Maybe it's even the Russians manipulating our social media. Who knows? It's the end of democracy. It's the end of the world. And so this is our third episode of this uh, in within a, a hundred years or so, right? About a hundred years. Third episode where the world is ending. The totalitarians have this new technology that they're better at. Somebody made a breakthrough in the American domestic political system that was a bit of a surprise. And, and because they were masters of 140 characters or right. the radio uh, fireside chat or 
the, the TV um, debate or whatever it might be. So maybe it is the end of the world. Maybe the third time it turns out that the first two times we got lucky and the third time crushed us. And, or maybe it's not. Maybe we're adaptable and resilient. Steve. Maybe we're not so stupid. Maybe people still read. I am going to ask you a fifth question. My children still read. I, I am going to ask you a fifth question. We've gone way long because I'm indulging myself. Am I going to cut you off? Never. I get it. You at a table. I, I, but, I'm going, but give me a, sh a brief. I'm answer. not succinct. Let's be honest. <laughs> ask a so, question, so and comes, it's a whole show. One here question. Here comes the fifth question. We talked about Russia and Ukraine, and it's going to be difficult to get the Russians to nego no, negotiate. And Xi Jinping, who knows what he's thinking, and Taiwan can only be broken, not taken over. And we've got Henry Kissinger saying the world is. We're never going to produce the kind. Reading a book has become a cult, countercultural act. Trouble, 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 trouble. Henry Luce, the founder of Time magazine, referred to the 20th century as the American century. Really briefly, how optimistic are you as you survey the scene? And, and, and I say optimistic, I'm not, you of all people are going to reject any attempt for me to kind of nudge you into a, some sort of Pollyannish statement. What I want here is a historian speaking. Does the 21st century look like another American century? For sure. Let's be honest. The 20th century was the American century. Why? Because Germany went from being our enemy to being our friend. That's a good friend to have. Japan went from being our enemy to being our friend. There are a lot of countries that became our friend. And there are a lot of other countries that would like to become our friend. We have a system. If we understand our own system, if we know who we are, if we know how we got here, if we know what makes this country powerful, not infallible, certainly not infallible, but powerful. If we understand who we are and how we got here and what we're capable of, and, uh, we can project forward pretty far here. Our system has capabilities because it's got corrective mechanisms. It's got adaptability. It's got re when we make a mistake and we make some doozies, and we've made some doozies recently and we'll make more mistakes, we can correct them. When Xi Jinping does zero COVID for a few years and then he repeals zero COVID in the dead of night, and there aren't very many corrective mechanisms in a system like that. China is a breathtaking civilization. It predates us by millennia. Let's be honest. We have to understand how remarkable China is and, and that we have to live, share the planet with China. But on whose terms? On what terms? What are the terms of sharing the planet? And the terms are terms, I hope, that we in this fantastic club that we've created known as the West, which is North America, Europe, the first island chain in Asia, and many other partners, Israel in the Middle East, and we could go on, and needs to be expanded and needs to be cultivated like a garden to bring up George Schultz again, right. constant cultivation of the garden. All of that is within our grasp. And we're the only ones who can ruin it. It can't be ruined from the outside. Who are we? Why did we get to where we are? What is American power? Where does it come from? How it can it be used? Who are our friends? And let's teach that to the next generation and let them appreciate it, including the fact that our system allows condemnation of our system, not just criticism. That is a strength that other systems do not have and can never have. They're afraid of their own shadow. Every day is existential for them. A dissident here, a dissident there, and they got the largest Ministry of State Security you've ever seen to try to police all of that. Police the internet, police the public sphere. We, fortunately, don't have a system like that. We have a different system. Why and how and who and everything. That's who we are. Let's, let's discuss that on our next show. On our next show. If I get invited back. <laughs> thank Stephen you. Stephen Kotkin, thank you.
For Uncommon Knowledge, the Hoover Institution and Fox Nation, I'm Peter Robinson.